The Toad Alchemy, Chapter 1, Meeting on the Lily River. A faint autumn sun was breaking through the low-hanging branches of the river willows. The cool wind gently swayed the curved trees, and the dense leaves of water lilies huddled into large, dark green islands on the water's surface near the bank. The watermill was making a measured noise, and the melody of an unusual musical instrument with a sharp but deep sound was coming from the bank. From time to time, along with the instrument, indistinct singing was heard in a language alien to this region. Perhaps even those who lived in the southwestern part of the beach swamps would hardly be able to make out the words of this song since in all the provinces of the Swamp Kingdom, they had long been speaking High Croak, and old languages like this were used except among the keepers of knowledge about several ancient toad professions, which were rapidly replaced by elementary magic. Just at that time, a young hunter was passing along the forest path that stretched from the northern boundary of the royal marshes far to the north along the Lily River. And when he heard this strange song, he stopped and began to listen to the words. He did not know this language, but he remembered how his grandmother used to sing to him stories about toad druids from the northern forests in Drong, and later translated everything into croak. Some of what he heard by the river seemed familiar to him, and the legend of the blooming fern and its incredibly strong properties came to his mind. For new generations of toads, the legend has long turned into a bedtime story, and no one has seriously treated such stories of old toads. In general, the toads of the kingdom started to forget the heritage of the ancient lands a long time ago. After the unification of the Swamp Kingdom in its heyday during the time of Krog II, the most famous king since the settlement of the Southern Marshes, the toads crept closer to the capital and adjusted to the interests of the crown, which at that time consisted in maintaining peace with neighbouring warlike tribes, developing new crafts and trades and, of course, strengthening the position of the Swamp Kingdom. Toads began to leave their old lands in the north and west, almost completely left the forests, and with this came the oblivion of the former sources of power and knowledge. What brings you here, hunter? A low voice sounded and pulled the wandering toad out of his thoughts. It's not every day in these parts you can see someone from the royal marshes. The figure of an old toad in a yellow, worn wool cape with a hood appeared in front of the hunter. The toad was leaning on a massive oak staff, twisted at the thick upper end, from which small branches with young green leaves were sticking out. There was curiosity and wariness in his gaze at the same time. "'My name is Borg the Hunter,' replied the wanderer. It's not every day you get to see a toad living on the river bank in the forest lands. You haven't seen a lot of things yet, Borg the Hunter, growled the elder, frowning, and then softened and added, Forgive me for my rudeness. I spent too much time among fireflies, mushrooms, water lilies and books, and completely forgot how to greet my guests. My name is Albog, and I am an alchemist. You've come a long way and are probably very tired. Come into my hut, rest, and tell me your story. The alchemist led the guest through fragrant juniper bushes and invited him into his house, which was thickly entwined with ivy. Most of the toads in the kingdom inhabited mushroom houses, but the old toad lived in a ramshackle hut with a water mill. It was at least a hundred years old, and although it was built of sturdy wood, the cold river winds and decades of recent frosts had left many cracks in it. 
Due to his age and maybe partial indifference, the alchemist only managed to seal up the cracks with a mixture of moss and clay, which sometimes lay rather carelessly on the texture of the wood. Despite the appearance of the hut, it was warm and cosy inside. In the middle of the main room, there was a massive oak table with burnt areas on the surface, and every corner of the room was reinforced with pine beams covered with thick bunches of fluorescent mushrooms that illuminated the space with a soft turquoise light. Borg had eaten nothing since the morning and gladly accepted a piece of dragonfly pie and a mug of swamp ale from the alchemist. For a while, the toads were silent and watched through the window as the Lily River slowly flowed, turning the wheel of the mill. Evening fog gradually descended on the bank lands, and the cheerful singing of birds was replaced by a choir of crickets, buzzing insects, and occasional splashes in the water. So, what brought you to the woodlands? The alchemist broke the silence. I'm not just a hunter, began Borg. Ten years ago, I graduated from the School of Spear and Bow in the Royal Marshes, then worked at the court for a while. One day, I was hunting south of the castle and drove a golden-winged dragonfly into a trap. These dragonflies are very rare in our area. Beside myself with excitement, I covered the distance to a favorable position on a rock in a few jumps and killed a dragonfly with a well-aimed shot. It turned out that the commander of the Royal Guard was watching my work from the fortress wall. He was very impressed and later called me to him and said that they needed such warriors. But he couldn't just take me into his guard. By tradition, a candidate for the guards must bring a rare trophy from the woodlands. The head of a giant slug. That's why I came here. At these words... Borg thought about it and took a big sip of swamp ale. "'I see that your intentions are serious, Hunter,' said Albog, slowly stroking his beard. "'And I want to warn you that your way will be more difficult than you expected. No one has seen giant slugs in these areas for more than two years. There are only small species left, and there are so few of them that you won't find enough for a pottage for a whole day. Where did they go? asked Borg, puzzled. It happened very quickly. No one understood the reasons for their relocation, but I still managed to find out something. They headed north across the river. I don't understand. Why north? Aren't the woodlands the most suitable for their life? I have some guesses, but I would not make premature conclusions, the alchemist replied. He looked old in the dim light coming from the mushrooms, which only emphasized his numerous wrinkles, thick grey eyebrows and deep-set eyes. Borg noticed that, despite his unshakable calm and thoughtfulness, the old toad was happy about something. After waiting a bit, the alchemist said, If, after hearing the news, you still intend to continue your journey, I can help you. I have long intended to go about my business in the northern forests. I have never gone beyond the borders of the woodlands, and I do not know how long the whole journey can take, said the hunter. Without an experienced guide, I will not get to the northern lands. Give me some time to think, Albog. If you let me spend the night at your house, I'll give you the answer tomorrow, and you will tell me what you want in return for the help. Chapter 2 On the Way Borg woke up early at dawn, but the alchemist was not around, and he decided to see the hut in the morning light. Old, crumbling pieces of parchment with chaotic notes, maps, and sketches of plants and mushrooms were everywhere. The shelves were filled with heavy volumes with titles in a language he did not know. Probably it was Drong. 
When Borg was leaving the bedroom, he almost tripped over a pile of roots and berries which were not there yesterday. I see you're up already. Albog suddenly stumbled into the hut. I couldn't sleep tonight, and I decided not to waste time in vain and stock up on food for a few days. He said that, throwing an armful of colourful mushrooms towards the pile. Albog sat down on a bench and took out his pipe. So, what have you decided, Hunter? Will you come with me to the Northern Lands, or will you return home to the Royal Marshes? I've decided to go, Alchemist, replied Borg. But what do you want in return? In my area, the services of a guide cost a lot. As I said, I have some business in the northern forests, and I was going to cross the river anyway. I am already quite old, Hunter, and I will not be hindered by a companion who skillfully wields a spear and a bow and can protect me in danger. That will be my price. Fair enough, said Borg. Borg checked his weapons, food and clothing, while Albog put the pre-selected notes and potion recipes into his bag. When everything was ready, the toads filled their canteens with water from the river, took another look at the map and moved north along the eastern bank of the Lily River. As with every journey, the beginning of it was the most pleasant. The toads walked in a good mood, passing narrow paths through birch and maple groves and admiring the reflections of the sun in the fast waters of the river. A day later, the main path moved away from the eastern bank and took the travellers beyond the cornfields into the shade of an oak alley, the ground was covered with yarrow and bright chicory flowers, and the scents of summer herbs and pine resin were still in the air, although there was already a sense of cool autumn. From time to time, travellers told each other stories from their lands. Albog said little about himself, but from his scattered stories about the woodlands and other old legends, Borg realized that the alchemist came from the north, from the former land of the Druids, and spent almost all his life on the riverbank in search of rare plants, insects and other creatures of the forest. He didn't mention anything more about his interests in the northern forests. On the third day of the journey, the toads made a halt in the evening golden hour and decided to spend the night under a large oak tree on the edge of the forest. Emerald ivy branches were crawling along the old bark of the tree. Looking at this foreign giant, Borg unwittingly recalled the royal tree in the courtyard of the castle. He had seen it only once, the day he was summoned by the commander of the Royal Guard. For many centuries, a complicated ritual had been carried out under that tree, with the selection of a fertilized royal egg, which was supposed to turn into a tadpole and then into a toad, the heir to the throne. The bushy branches of the oak reliably protected the travellers from the light rain that had started, and they gladly began to eat dried berries and mushrooms that Albog had prepared for the trip. It's getting cold, said the alchemist. The warm autumn days are over, and we should take care of new clothes that will protect us from the cold winds. In four days we will reach the bridge, but before we cross it, we should visit a merchant who lives nearby. He often has good clothes and furs. You know how quickly the winters come to us, and we will also need to replenish our food and drink supplies. Don't worry about the payment. Those mushrooms that I collected by the river don't grow in the merchant's land, and he will willingly part with a couple of warm clothes and a bag of dried dragonflies to get them. The night was cold, and Borg did not sleep well. After having breakfast with the remains of a dragonfly pie and warming up a little, the toads went on. The old toad remembered for a reason about the rapidly advancing cold weather. 
It rained all three days of their further journey, and the northern winds mercilessly blew through their woolen capes. Finally, they reached the fields in the bend of the river, from where they could already see the main road, stretching from the southern marshes to the bridge, and in the distance to the northeast, the dark blue outlines of the jaws of Moorbog, an impressive chain of mountains in the northern lands, were barely visible. There was no rain, but the sky was covered with heavy thunderclouds, and the travellers hurried through the tall stalks of rye so as not to get caught in the downpour. Right by the stone bridge, there is a small toad settlement, a border pond with a couple of merchants, a tavern, and a dozen residential buildings. More than the others, there stood out a striking mushroom hut with a huge lopsided hat. It has grown so much that its edges almost touched the ground. To prevent the cap from completely blocking the entrance to the house, two large oak logs were propped up from the side of the door, between which a sign was flaunted, Clogs Northern Goods. The merchant earned a lot during the last wave of migration of toads to the south and was able to secure a comfortable old age. And since his house was on a straight road leading to the former druid lands, where separate toad villages still existed, he often managed to meet rich travellers from the royal marshes interested in outlandish goods from the north. The toads passed through the low gate and rang the brass bell on the dark red door. A moment later, the door was opened by a plump toad of about 70 in a vest of soft brown leather and loose linen trousers with a green belt. Come in, dear guests from the south, the toad said politely. This way, please. Are you looking for something special? Clog's northern goods sell the rarest things in the whole kingdom. Thank you, Clog replied Albog, brushing the dust of the road from his cape, and was the first to enter the bizarre mushroom. We need warm clothes and food for two weeks of travel. Albog looked at Borg and added, Show my friend what arrows are made across the river. I'm sure he won't mind taking another quiver with him. What kind of business do an alchemist and a hunter have in the north? asked Clog with undisguised curiosity, opening a heavy chest with forged rivets and carved patterns of the northern toad tribes. I'm looking for a couple of rare specimens of mushrooms that, as far as I know, grow across the river. I don't hope for a quick search, so I called a friend with me. As for the mushrooms... Albog took a worn leather bag from his belt and opened it in front of the merchant. It contained ten perfectly preserved fly agarics with unusual purple hats. Such payment I will gladly accept, said Clorg with inspiration. Still, an unusual couple for these lands. An experienced alchemist and a hunter from the royal school of spear and bow. Borg looked at the merchant with wariness. Come on, Clorg laughed, putting his paws on his round belly. The school emblem on your spear glitters so brightly in the firelight that only a blind slug wouldn't notice it. And I'm also ashamed not to know that the old Albog comes from the druid lands and misses the frosty air in the endless pine forests. Isn't that right, old friend? Clorg winked cheerfully at the travellers and invited them to choose warm clothes from the chest, while he went to the cellar for two thick bags of dried dragonflies and berries. This should be enough for a couple of weeks. Clorg threw the bags on the bench. There is practically no one to hunt on the other side of the river at this time of the year, but with a good map of the druid lands, you will not be left without food and water at all. The nearest village is a week away from here. I've heard that they have a couple of excellent toad collectors who might tell you where to look for your rare specimens. 
Rare specimens, repeated Clog once more in a drawl. What are you up to this time, Albog, young warrior? The merchant turned to Borg. Did you hear that your friend brewed portions for Krog the Second himself? That's enough, Albog interrupted him. We didn't come here for your stories, Clog. For ten cave fly agarics, you owe another quiver of arrows to my friend. Albog put the provisions in his shoulder bag, took two thick fur capes from the chest, and saying goodbye, hurriedly left the merchant's house. Old Albog doesn't like to remember the past, said Clog, following the alchemist with his eyes. Obviously, the experience at court was not to his taste. Well, good luck to your search, Hunter. Clog handed Borg a quiver of black feathered arrows. Don't forget old Clog, and don't forget to put in a good word for me to the next traveller you meet. In the Clog's northern goods, there is always a thing for everyone. Borg said goodbye and slowly headed for the exit. Potions for Krog the Second, for the most outstanding Toad King, and why is this old Toad constantly silent? What else is he hiding from me? This was spinning in Borg's mind. There was no sign of Albog on the street, and Borg assumed that the alchemist had gone to the tavern at the crossroads near the bridge. On the wooden signboard of the place, there was a toad with bulging eyes and a pot-bellied flask in its paw. The tavern was called Toad Potion. Of course, you went here, muttered Borg to himself, and hid in the tavern from the coming downpour. It was hot inside. Fire was dancing in the four fireplaces on the lower level of the tavern. Apparently, the hostess was preparing properly for the cold night. Everywhere there was the murmur of toads who had come in for a mug of ale after a day's work in the fields. The clatter of wooden mugs mingled with the melodious ripples of the lute. Borg found out from the hostess that all the guest rooms were free that night and paid for one for himself and the alchemist. Alborg sat alone in the far corner and thoughtfully looked at the fire. Shadows danced on his tired face, hidden in a beard that was dishevelled after a week's travel, and it was not difficult to guess that he was remembering the past days. Borg silently put two mugs of swamp, or rather pondale, on the table, took off his cape and sat down next to him, looking at the old smoky fireplace. He took a couple of sips of the tart drink and started on a wry flatbed with cumin. I suppose you want to hear my story. Albog looked at the hunter and he nodded. As a young toad, I left my swamp village for the first time and headed south to the royal marshes. In the capital, I found a job as a doctor's apprentice, and every day spent a lot of time searching for ingredients for his healing ointments. In a couple of years, I managed to have enough experience and knowledge to enter the Royal Mage Academy at the Faculty of Alchemy. At that time, it still existed. I studied the amazing properties of the rarest mushrooms, algae and insect glands. I made some progress in elementary magic and used all my strength and knowledge to further study the gifts of nature to the smallest detail. From morning to night, I hid behind the books, brewed potent potions and conducted experiments on myself. In the end, I graduated with the title of an adept of alchemy and opened my shop near the royal castle. Things were going very well, and the kingdom was experiencing its heyday under the patronage of a wise king. More and more toad families moved to the royal marshes, and the demand for my potions healing mushrooms and fermented berries increased. One busy day, the royal counselor came to me without warning and asked me to follow him. I was stunned, but I couldn't refuse. 
He led me into the castle through the main entrance and escorted me to the throne room. That was the first time I saw King Krog II. He was already 200 years old, but even at that age, his formidable motionless figure, as if carved together with the toad throne, inspired deep reverence. He was kind and courteous and asked me questions about my business and my studies. In the end, he asked me if I wanted to become a royal alchemist and finally caught me off guard with this question. With his permission, I was given a day to think about it. That night, I couldn't close my eyes because I understood how much responsibility could fall on my shoulders if I agreed. The next morning, the counselor came to me again and took me to the king. Krog explained to me that he had been interested in alchemy for a long time, and against the backdrop of the growing strength of elementary magic, he saw great sense in having such an experienced alchemy specialist as me handle royal assignments. Of course, I understood what a great honor it was, and I agreed to serve as a court alchemist. I was introduced to a royal mage who had recently taken up this position, led around the castle, shown the legendary royal oak by the pond, and finally taken to the alchemist's chamber. The first few days, they did not disturb me and gave me the opportunity to get used to a new place. And then the first orders began to arrive, to make a potion against insomnia for the chief housekeeper, to prepare a batch of healing mushrooms for sick toads in impassable swamps, to brew a potion of endurance for the commander of the royal guard. And so, fifteen, maybe twenty years have passed. I loved my job. There was a lot of it, and I lost track of time. One day, the king himself came to me. He rarely did this because he was constantly busy or spent a lot of time in solitude. Still gently and politely, he asked me if I needed anything, if I was satisfied with the reward for my service, and then invited me for a walk in the royal garden. There, he told me that he was increasingly concerned that there was no heir left after him. It so happened that Krog II could not have offspring. He worked for many years and managed to create a strong kingdom and bring peace to the Toadlands. He was no less proud of his royal entourage and deeply respected the counselor, the mage and me. However, he did not feel enough wisdom and strength in anyone to accept his royal staff and put on the crown. He was silent for a while, peering into the empty royal pond, and then he looked at me with his deep eyes and said, Albog, my friend, I have aged a lot, and my mind is beginning to veil. Soon I will lay down the crown and begin the search for a worthy successor, but I am afraid that the time allotted to me will not be enough, and therefore I will ask you for one last favor, after which you and I will part our ways. I want you to make a potion of three thousand years for me. There's a cold shadow hanging over the kingdom, Alborg, and I need more time. Give it to me and you will make an invaluable contribution to the history of our swamps, rivers and forests. I'm not going to put pressure on you, and I want you to think about what I just told you. But don't hesitate too long. I feel my strength is slowly leaving me. 
He left me with painful thoughts at the Royal Oak, and I never saw him again. Then it seemed to me that this was madness. Even if I managed to collect all the ingredients and brew this mythical potion, I wouldn't dare give it to even the wisest of all toads. I didn't doubt Krog's wisdom for a second, and yet no one should live longer than the time allotted to him, more than a thousand years. I was scared, and I didn't know what to do. At night, I packed up my most necessary things, secretly left the castle and went to the woodlands. I hid in the woodlands for a long time, avoiding the roads, until I realized that they were not looking for me. Then I found an abandoned water mill with an old hut on the bank of the Lily River and settled there. And a year later, I found out that Krog the Second had died, having failed to carry out his plans. There was no successor. A cold winter came to our lands and turmoil began in the kingdom. The long winter and famine took many toads' lives, and a grain of doubt began to arise in me. Did I do the right thing? What would have happened if I hadn't been afraid back then and had done for the king what he asked? Would he have been able to prevent the disaster he warned us about? These questions, alas, remained without answer. Some time later, I heard that the Royal Council had chosen the Royal Mage, Florg, as the defender of the swamp and forest lands, and put the crown on him. Florg was a worthy toad, with a lot of experience and a kind heart, and the toad people once again had hope for the prosperity of the kingdom. I know him well and respect him, Borg. Under his skillful leadership, it was possible to rally the toads and put things in order. But we won't have a king like Krog anymore, and I'll regret letting him down for the rest of my days. Chapter 3 Gorge of the Amphibian Gods The next morning in the border pond was cool and clear. The pale sun lit up the rye fields and the road that led over the stone bridge to the north. All was soaked from the night rain. The pond gradually woke up and began to move. Borg thought about Albog's story for a long time. At night he had troubling dreams about the frozen swamp kingdom. In the dream, an old king with wisps of grey hair sticking out from under an ugly crown came limping up to him, looked at him imperiously, and silently handed him a bottle with some dark green potion. Borg took a sip. His stomach and lungs twisted, and he fell on the black ice, gasping for breath. After that, he woke up. For a while, he looked at the dense tapestries with images of toads working in the fields, floating on water lilies in a pond, and running through dark forests with boughs. In the dim morning light, with dust motes slowly floating through it, it all seemed a continuation of the dream. Borg didn't want to get up from a soft, warm bed at all, but there was a long way ahead of them. He slowly got up, put on his marsh-coloured knitted cape with leather straps, fastened his spear, bow and new arrows behind his back, and, throwing his travel bag over his shoulder, went upstairs where the alchemist was already waiting for him and, as usual, smoking a pipe. The travellers thanked the hostess of the tavern for the warm welcome and headed across the bridge. The road ran straight north. To the right in the distance loomed the outlines of the jaws of Moorbog, high mountains with sharp peaks, named after the deity worshipped by all the toad warriors and hunters, 
and to the left, beyond the pine forest, the gentle ledges of another more ancient rocky ridge were barely visible. Soon the travelers reached the plain where the old road forked. The main road continued to go north, and the second steeply went west through the woods. No one has walked on it for a long time, and it is overgrown with thick, dark grass. Wait, Bog. This way. Albog pointed to the abandoned road. Why, aren't we going to the northern forests? asked Bog. We are, but not to the northern ones. We are going to the croak forest. The croak forest? exclaimed the hunter. You didn't tell me anything about it. How many more riddles and mysteries are waiting for me, Albog? I didn't lie, but I didn't tell the whole truth either. The slugs did move north, but then turned west. In the northern villages, people saw them and confirmed that. There's only one place in the west they could have gone, and that's the Croak Forest. All I've heard about this forest is that no toad has gone there for hundreds of years, and there are reasons for that, Borg blurted out sharply. That's not quite true. I was in that forest once. Albog sat down on a round boulder and leaned on his staff. Trust me, Borg. If you're looking for a giant slug, you'll find it there. I'm sorry I didn't tell you the whole truth right away, but you wouldn't have come with me if you'd heard about the croak forest back in my hut. I know the way, but I'm not young anymore, and I wouldn't get there alone. Albog smiled gently and looked into Borg's eyes. You remind me of someone with your persistence, and I want to help you. Let me take you to the forest, and you will help me finish my old business there. Will you go on with me? You leave me no choice, old toad, <sighs> said Borg, and sighing, looked at the distant rocky ledge. After a week of travelling, I can't return to the royal marshes empty-handed. I'll go with you, if you tell me what your business is in that forest and what dangers await us there. I have to meet someone there, an old acquaintance of mine. He poses no threat to us, but the forest itself is changeable and can be very unpredictable. Albog stroked his beard and thought, as for the further way, we could go around the rocks and then we would lose three days. But I know a passage through the rocks, an ancient gorge that I once walked through many years ago. But that was truly a long time ago, and this place could have also changed after a long winter. Which way do you choose, Borg? Lead through the gorge, Albog. I want to get home before the first frost. By the end of the day, the toads reached the edge of the forest, beyond which the formidable stone walls of the gorge of the amphibian gods could be seen. According to legends, the god Ungolok came out of this gorge and wandered through these lands in the form of a large white lizard and taught the first toads to speak. We'll spend the night here. Albog pointed to a round clearing with moss. And tomorrow at dawn, we will move through the gorge. The toads had enough food, and they cooked a hearty dinner on the coals, after which they wrapped themselves in their fur capes and fell asleep on the soft ground. Before sunrise, Borg was awakened by the creaking of trees. Gusts of winds strongly bent the elastic pine trunks, and thunderclouds were already sparkling in the distance. It's time to leave, he heard Albog, who was packing the last things into bags. In half an hour, we will reach the gorge and hide from the storm. Borg had never seen rocks so close before, and in the impending thunderstorm, the stone rift seemed to him the entrance to another gloomy world. Finally, 
The toads entered the gorge. The wind howled inside and small stones constantly crumbled under their feet and the travellers had to hold on to the black walls in order not to fall. The first part of the way into the depth of the rift seemed difficult to them and they were relieved to find that the ground was gradually becoming smoother and harder. When it became completely dark and the howling of the wind died down, Albog took a small flask of transparent ointment from his bag and applied it to the upper twisted part of the staff. When interacting with the air, the ointment began to glow softly and the interior of the gorge appeared in front of them in a bluish light. At the top, the rift was fused and the further path lay through a long cave, slightly going down. The walls of the cave were covered with hundreds of mushrooms and dense moss, from which numerous reddish tendrils with dark cones at the ends stretched towards the travellers. Perhaps it was a trick of the light, but it seemed to Borg that these tendrils moved slightly as he approached, and he wanted to touch them with his finger. We need to walk more carefully, and we shouldn't touch the walls. Albog stopped his hand and pulled his hood tighter. The cave seemed to be trying to study the uninvited guests, and the deeper they moved, the stronger the reddish tendrils stretched towards them. Some mushrooms pulsed with green and purple light in the places where the toad's paws stepped. The gorge of the amphibian gods came to life. After a while, Borg began to think that he heard a strange low rumble, which then turned into an eerie low singing with long repeated words. It was getting noticeably colder. The toads were approaching the heart of the mountain. Albog, what's going on? Borg was a brave hunter, but even he was not at ease in this place. They are the spirits of the mountain, replied the alchemist. They want to scare us away, although there is no reason for that. Many centuries ago, Ungolok was born here. Many dangerous creatures roamed and crawled through these lands, and the born god was protected by the most ancient forces that lived in these rocks. And although Ungolok left the gorge, the spirits of the mountains continued to protect this place. They have no mind, only a purpose laid down at the moment of their creation. If we don't stay here for a long time, we won't be in any danger. At some point, the low rumble in Borg's head intensified and then abruptly subsided and the fear receded. Unexpectedly, the long passage of the cave merged into a large circular room with smooth, damp walls, and it was amazing that the ground in it was completely covered with ferns, which grew in a spiral unfolding from the center. Along the contour of this spiral, multicolored stones were laid out, which shimmered in the blue light of Albog's staff. Despite the lack of sunlight, the leaves of the ferns were juicy, with bright red veins. Did you think the place where God was born would look somehow different? asked Albog, noticing Borg's surprise. I have heard legends about the old gods, but they seem to me to be ordinary fairy tales, something very distant, and when I stand here, I can't believe what I see and feel, and yet it turned out to be true. I'm glad I went with you, Albog, said Borg, and nodded gratefully to the alchemist. Carefully stepping over the fern which swayed slightly from the wind in the cave, the toads headed for the opposite side of the room, from where the cave led higher. The rest of the way through the gorge was uneventful. Borg and Albog exchanged observations about the unusual flora of the cave and did not notice how they reached the end of the rift. 
it turned out that the storm had passed to the east of the rocks without touching the hills of eternal bloom, and on the other side, a clear sunny day was waiting for the travelers. The hills of eternal bloom was an amazing land where all year round some blooming plants were replaced by others, and this cycle was never interrupted. Surrounded from the south and east by chains of mountains and from the north by the Drong River, named after the oldest toad language, the hills were a hidden part of the Swamp Kingdom. Due to their location, no one lived on the hills, and only occasionally one could meet a curious toad that decided to explore this unusual place. Not a single tree grew on the hills, only rare shrubs. There were also no swamps and ponds, but countless flowers. In summer, when poppies and cornflowers bloom, the red and bright blue colour blinded the eyes and, closer to the beginning of autumn, the hills were painted in yellow-white colours of golden rod and yarrow. The buzzing of insects mixed with the loud murmur of a dozen streams that burst out of the ground and disappeared into it again, skirting a dozen colourful hills. It was warmer here than to the east of the mountains. The toads took off their fur capes and, having wrapped them in rolls, attached them to shoulder bags. Evening will come soon. We need to look for a place to camp by the nearest stream said Albog, checking the map. In two days we will reach the Drong River and cross it by swimming in the shallowest place. There will be one more day of travel to the Croak Forest. We will be there until the beginning of October. The toads reached a small stream, hurrying over the rocks between three large hills. There were a lot of dragonflies swarming over the huge purple flowers, the names of which Borg did not know, and Borg deftly shot several for dinner with his bow. Dried insects were already boring them, and it was nice to fill their stomachs with fresh warm food and cool, clean water from the stream. It was dusk, and bright stars were lighting up the sky, Soon the constellations of the sorcerer's staff and the water lily appeared. Borg and Albog spread their fur capes on the ground and lay on their backs to get a better look at the starry sky. Have you ever heard the legend of the fern flower? asked Albog the dozing Borg. Every little toad in this kingdom has heard it, replied Borg, shaking off his slumber. It became a legend only because almost no one could see the fern flower, continued Albog. It blooms only one day a year, or rather, at night, during the hunter's moon at the very beginning of October, when the entire harvest has already been harvested, and animals roam the fields in search of food. They say the toads who have to do great things are born on this night. In the whole kingdom, I know of only two places where the fern has ever bloomed. The royal pond in the southern marshes, where the first stone of the castle was laid, and the croak forest, where you and I are going. The last time the flower was seen on the pond was when a tadpole appeared from the royal egg which grew into the worthiest toad of the last millennium, King Krog the Second. No more ferns bloomed in the southern marshes. At that time, no one attached great importance to this, since the court did not know what power this flower had. But the fact is that it is the fern flower that is the main component of the potion of three thousand years. The flower gives part of its life-giving powers to a newborn toad, which is destined to change the course of events, and it also breathes centuries of life into the one who takes a sip of this potion. 
Unfortunately, I found out all this only after the king's death, when I was hiding in the woodlands. I went all over the kingdom, looking for mentions of the potion, and found the answers in the croak forest. So, we're going to the forest to get this flower, asked Borg, having come to his senses after the words of the alchemist. And what about the slug hunt? The giant slugs are there too, Borg, reassured him Albog. I did not immediately understand what happened, but when there were no slugs left in the woodlands, I realized that someone had summoned them. This is powerful magic, and only one toad in the kingdom could do it. A forest sorcerer whom I met many years ago and who told me that the legend of the flower is no fiction. Trusting me and my interests, he told me that every year he looks forward to the night when the fern flower blooms. He is attracted by the image of the flower's beauty and its immense power, but he never planned to use it for his purposes. When I told him my story and mentioned King Krog's request, the sorcerer frowned. We argued, and he insisted that I leave the ancient forest. And now, when by the will of the sorcerer all the slugs from the south have crept into the forest, only one thing comes to mind. The fern will bloom again, and this time with special force. But why would the sorcerer summon slugs? asked Borg without understanding. He called himself the protector of the forest and everything that grows and lives in it. He is afraid that someone with evil thoughts will use the power of the flower. The sorcerer is wise, but he does not see the full picture, just like I didn't see it on the day Krog asked me. Albog paused for a moment and sat down to clear his pipe. I was also afraid that I would give the king an instrument of unlimited power, and although I did not fully believe in the possibility of brewing such a strong potion, I ran away so as not to tempt either myself or the king. You already know what happened next. Years of frost and famine, gloomy whispers and uncertainty in the kingdom— I could have prevented it, but I didn't. And now, when in a few days someone who will do great deeds is to be born, I must be ready to offer him my help. And if he asks me to give him more time, as Krog once asked, I will fulfill his request. Borg's head was buzzing from what he heard, when he saw Albog near his dilapidated hut on the river bank, it seemed to him that he had met a strange, grumpy old toad who was slowly going crazy surrounded by mushrooms and insects. But now an experienced royal alchemist with a difficult fate has straightened up in front of him, who has come a long way and learned to see what is hidden from the eyes of simple toads like Borg. He felt even more respect for him, but could not find what to say at that moment. I'm sorry, Borg. I was captured by strong feelings and I need to walk a little, said Albog, getting up from the ground and leaning on his staff. He then slowly disappeared behind the hill. Without waiting for the alchemist to return, Borg fell asleep on the soft ground under the lulling sound of the stream. The next morning was also clear. In a good mood, the toads continued their way through the hills. Albog told Borg a lot of interesting details about the plants and flowers that they met on the way. For example, tea from polychrome field flower quickly relieved headaches, and a pinch of dried moon moss acted as a strong hypnotic. After a couple of days, the toads reached the Drong River. 
It flowed down from the western slope of the amphibian God's Gorge and was the last frontier before the Croak Forest. The distance to the other bank was short, so the toads threw their bags, backpacks, weapons and staff across the river and then carefully entered the rushing waters and swam along the very bottom, skillfully pushing off with their hind legs. There was the last throw to the forest across the fields, which the toads almost completely overcame in half a day. The day was cool, with changeable weather, and by evening a thick fog descended on the fields. Borg and Albog decided to make a halt earlier to have a good rest before entering the forest. They found a thick tree felled by the wind and stretched their capes between its broken branches and the ground, pressing the edges down with stones. The toads dined on crunchy insects that Borg had caught the day before in the hills and then lay down under their warm canopies and fell fast asleep. Chapter 4 The Croak Forest by morning, the fog had receded, and the toads saw the mighty croak forest. Straight rows of trees with long silver trunks towered in front of them, which ended in ornate crowns with orange foliage. It was like an endless maze, confusing the traveller to take him away from the heart of the forest. There were many rumours about the croak forest, Someone said that the first conscious toads came out of it, although there was no recorded historical information about it. The others said that the forest had always been wild and that forces lived there, fiercely defending their land, beyond the control of even the most powerful toad sorcerers. Although one of the well-known facts about the forest was that one day the elder brother of the royal mage, Florg, who at that time was still studying at the Swamp Academy, settled there, and throughout the years of deep study of the power of this forest, turned into its defender. They tell a lot of terrible things about this place, but I hope for the prudence of the sorcerer, said Albog, and confidently walked through the silvery trees, practically not leaning on his oak staff. Borg hurried after him with his spear at the ready. The further the travellers advanced into the depth of the forest, the gloomier and more impassable it became. Over time, the beautiful silver trunks were replaced by lower trees with powerful roots and dense, bumpy bark, which grew so close to each other that their branches intertwined, creating narrow tree arches. Sunlight could not penetrate through the thick brown foliage, and it became difficult to breathe. Pores constantly fell into the wet, squelching moss. How far do we have to go? asked Borg. The rest of the day and part of the night. Soon we will reach the stone plateau, and after passing it, we will get into the domain of the forest sorcerer. The hunter frowned. We need to set up a camp and rest. We're barely moving our paws anymore. Why are we in such a hurry? Albog turned abruptly and looked at Borg with his penetrating gaze, in which, for the first time since their acquaintance, anxiety was read. I feel that the forest has changed. It is impossible to set up a camp and burn bonfires in this part of the forest, and I wouldn't risk closing my eyes here, even for a short sleep. So far, the path has been calm, but do not be deceived, Borg. We are being watched, and we are not expected in the heart of the forest. The toads walked slowly on the wet moss, which was sinking more and more under the weight of their paws. 
There was no sound of birds singing, no rustling of leaves. The forest froze in anticipation. Finally, they reached a high step of stone slate, beyond which the plateau began. They scrambled up the crumbling stones with difficulty and saw in front of them a sea of grey fir trunks that randomly stuck out of stone cracks. These were not fluffy green fir trees, as in the southern lands, but a gloomy forest of centuries-old evil spirits with ugly broken twigs fingers and branches with black needles that had sunk to the ground under the weight of years. As soon as the toad paws stepped onto the stone plateau, the forest began to whisper. To the left and to the right, translucent shadows swept past the travellers. The fir trunks creaked threateningly, and their bark cracked from tension. Fear crept deep into the souls of both toads. Albog offered Borg to drink a concentration potion, and it became a little easier to move forward, although danger still circled the toads. The nightmare of the fir forest seemed endless, but at some point the trees ended and a huge section of bare stone slabs stretching far to the west opened up in front of the toads. As they made their way through the forest, it got dark and a large orange moon was visible in the sky, which was supposed to become full the next night. Albog, we should rest for at least a few hours, said exhausted Borg. Good. Lie down and rest. I'll stay on guard. Albog sat down on the twisted log, took a small bottle of some bluish liquid from his bag and drank it. He leaned his paws on his staff and, without blinking, stared into the darkness of the forest. Borg fell asleep almost instantly, but all night he was tormented by nightmares. He dreamed that he was walking through the black forest after the alchemist, but began to lag. Borg called him, but he did not turn around and only moved further away from him, hiding behind the trees. Borg's paws sank knee-deep into the ground, and the terrible, gnarled trees tightened into a ring around him. They wrapped their roots around him and dragged him deep into the thick mud. Then he dreamed of a forest sorcerer who was hovering between tall fir trees and silently looking at him with empty black eye sockets. Borg tried to run, but no matter which way he turned, he always found himself at a steep cliff with a bottomless abyss under his paws. Only with dawn did the bad dreams recede, and Borg was able to sleep without worries. It's time to go, Hunter. Albog woke him up when the sun had already fully illuminated the cold stone slabs. How long have I been asleep? asked Borg, coming to his senses. I don't know. Half night and a couple of hours with dawn. But we have to go. We have to get to the heart of the Croak Forest by the evening. For a long time, the toads walked on the rocks until they reached the descent into a deep ravine, where a new section of dense forest with intertwined roots and crowns of trees began. The sun disappeared behind the brown foliage again, and the toads plunged into semi-darkness. Once again, Albog used his glowing ointment, covering his staff with it, and continued to lead Borg deeper into the forest. The toads made their way through the thicket to the west for at least two hours, when suddenly the setting sun began to gradually break through the thickness of the branches. The trees parted, and Borg saw in front of him an oak 
grove covered with mushrooms of amazing sizes and shapes. Some mushroom hats were twisted into spirals with a shiny surface, while others had massive legs with round windows and such wide hats that they lay on top of each other in multi-level steps. Each mushroom was covered with creeping plants that tightly curled upwards and hung from the caps in a green web. Suddenly, a deep voice rolled through the grove, scaring the travellers. Through milky mist and mountain spines and empty darkness of the pines, two travellers have come to me. What is the reason? I can't see. An elder toad with selfish dreams. He knows everything he deems. A hunter from the ruler's marsh. The folks are evil there and harsh. Why have you entered my domain? I won't believe you've gone astray. I'll give you an advice with pleasure that is much worthy than a treasure. There's nothing here to seek, my toads. You have to turn to eastern roads. But if you still refuse to hear, there will be trouble, will be fear. Have I not made it clear to you, Albog, that you are not welcome in the forest? Finally, Borg noticed the figure of a sorcerer on the balcony of one of the giant mushrooms. He wrapped his paws tightly around the intertwined bars and stared menacingly at the toads, flashing his big eyes. His grey beard fell below his knees and was tied at the end with a ring of ivy. Instead of a hat, the sorcerer had a mushroom on his head, put upside down. Thin branches of a tree with triangular red leaves were woven into his old black robe. Listen to me, sorcerer, Albog stepped forward. I'm sorry that we parted in a quarrel, but you don't see everything that happens in the kingdom. Hiding in your magic grove, you didn't see the darkness that descended on the southern marshes. You didn't starve like hundreds of toad families. You brought this darkness upon yourself, building fancy castles, choosing kings and starting wars. The sorcerer cut him off sharply. My stupid brother is now sitting on his royal chair and thinks that he is doing well and ruling only for good. And then toads like him dare to ask their court magicians to prolong their lives, to continue enjoying their powers. Your brother is a worthy mage and ruler. Albog tried to calm the sorcerer. He has his flaws, but he does his job with honor. But it's not about him. You know that today a toad will be born, which is destined to unite all folks again, as Krog once managed. And this time, I have to do the right thing. So that's why you came. You decided to steal a fern flower from the heart of the forest, and you also brought this thug with you, blurted out the sorcerer with a contemptuous nod in the direction of Borg. Well, I decided a long time ago that brute force is not my way, but I will not stop the guardians of the forest who will protect with dignity what should remain untouched. With these words, the sorcerer disappeared inside the mushroom, and from all sides from behind the trees, huge brown slugs with disgusting black mouths full of small sharp teeth crawled towards the toads. All that remained was to run into the depths of the grove along its narrow paths. The slugs were rapidly coming up from behind, and Borg was desperately looking for a place to hide. Ahead, he saw a passage in a stone embankment with veins of thick grass, and shouted to Albog to follow him. 
the alchemist could barely keep up, limping behind with a staff in his hands. Running into the passage, Albog stumbled, and the slug that overtook him from behind grabbed his paw and began to drag him back into the grove. Borg noticed it in time, and in a long jump, poked the slug in the side with a spear. The slug hissed and released Albog's paw. Let's run for cover, shouted Borg, and dragged the alchemist further down the passage of stones. They ran almost to the end of it, when suddenly a new enemy blocked the road in front of them. It was a huge silver slug, even bigger and faster than its fellows. He let out a terrible wheeze and rushed towards Borg, who was already standing ready with his spear. At the school of spear and bow, young fighters were not trained for such battles. But still, years of training and hunting made Borg a strong and agile warrior. The slugs behind the toads stopped, blocking their escape way, and Borg bravely repelled the giant's attacks, covering the alchemist with himself. After several unsuccessful attempts to grab the hunter, the silver slug decided to lean on him with all its weight to pin him to the stones, but Borg foresaw the giant's attack and at the last moment jumped aside and cut his neck with a chopping spear blow. The slug fell to the ground in front of the toads and panted heavily. Stop this madness! There was a sorcerer's cry who suddenly appeared at the other end of the passage. He hit the ground with his staff and a dozen slugs behind the toads spread out in different directions. The sorcerer hurriedly approached the dying silver slug and looked angrily at Albog and Borg. If you are ready to risk your lives and kill the Prince of Slugs for your selfish purposes, then take the flower and get out of the forest. The sorcerer closed his eyes and began to chant a spell in low guttural sounds, slowly swinging his staff, at the end of which a yellow stone with many facets was fixed. The spell stopped the bleeding, but the slug's wound was too serious. Let me help, said Albog, and knelt in front of the slug. He took out an oblong vessel with a translucent white ornament from his alchemist's bag and put it into the edges of the wound. The sorcerer continued to recite the spell, and the wound gradually began to heal. The skin in the center of the wound became rough, and the silver giant stopped breathing heavily. He carefully rolled over from side to belly, looked at Albog, and slowly crawled away after the other slugs. We didn't want this battle, said Borg, and yet you almost killed the last slug prince, said the sorcerer a little more gently. However... This is also my fault. I wanted to scare you away from the heart of the forest, but I understand your strength and agility, Hunter. The sorcerer sighed. If you really need a fern flower, you can take it, but please don't come back to this forest again. With a last inquisitive glance at the travelers, the sorcerer adjusted his robe and disappeared. I'm afraid you'll have to go home empty-handed, Borg, said the alchemist. After the journey we've made and everything you've shown me and told me, Albog, I'm not sure I really want to join the Royal Guard anymore. I want to see our whole kingdom, to visit places where I have never been before, to understand what toads do in the northern lands and impassable swamps. During the last two weeks, I've learnt more than I have in ten years, Albog. That's indeed an amazing feature of all great adventurers. The traveller never returns home the same, said the alchemist with a smile. The sun will soon set, my friend. Help me find the flower.
Borg and Albog came out of the stone passage and found themselves in a clearing, with a dozen tall trees and such thick trunks that even four toads could not embrace them by holding their paws together. The whole ground was covered with ferns and ivy crawling through it and climbing up the trees. This is the heart of the forest, Borg, said the alchemist with delight. When the sunset rays were slipping away along the tops of the colossus trees and the bright hunter's moon lit up in the sky, Borg noticed a small white flower in the very centre of the clearing. It was so unremarkable that an inattentive traveller could easily have missed it and passed by. They had come such a long way for this small wonder of nature, and so much more had to happen for it to play its role in the fate of the Swamp Kingdom. This is a truly amazing thing. The Toad Alchemy, thought Borg, and slowly approached the Fern Flower with Albog. The End 